Hello and welcome to a very special How I Paint Things. Now today we are going to go back and recover something that I've already touched on in the past. The reason for this is that when I last came to Africa Core, uh, I had not the greatest equipment and maybe, you know, those old Perry miniatures, I know a lot of folks really like them, but personally I do prefer the Warlord games Africa Core that have come out since. Uh, so with improve, you know, new and improved light and sound and all that, I thought it would be worth touching on some of the older guides. And there are one or two different methods in this one, which you might find interesting. Now, as always, when it comes to historical painting, there is a slightly longer list of paints if you want to keep things as accurate as you can. And I'm going to talk through one or two of those. So in order to keep it brief, all of the paints will be listed in the description below. Let's get started. So once I've assembled my guy, one of the things I've done which I don't ordinarily is to apply some sand to his base previous to priming him. Uh, somebody suggested this to me once upon a time and said it would be easier. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see as we go. I've used here Desert Yellow from Vallejo, and I've actually sprayed this over a very light spritz of white. Reason being, if we spray that yellow straight over grey, it's not going to come out perfectly, for our purposes, it will probably be fine, but I'm being a little fuss pot. So I put down some white first, just a very light, quick glaze of that, and then over goes a desert yellow. Now you could just as easily use a bone color or even white, but the little bit of warmth that we're going to get from the yellow under here, I think is going to help us out with a few of our colors. Same too, a couple of the items of equipment, like his gas mask canister and his helmet, they are going to be a warm yellow later, easier to just do this now. Now we're painting historical miniatures, which means invariably I've got to give you a brief rundown on the uniforms, because the German tropical colonial uniform was a disaster. It was an absolute mess. Now you might notice I am holding quite a dark green. This is Russian uniform. And the German tropical uniform, it was invented by the Tropical Institute of Hamburg. Now, I don't know if you know Hamburg, uh, it is nowhere near the tropics. Uh, so the uniform that they designed was a tropical green. It was quite dark. If you look at black and white photos of the era, it was really dark. And Russian uniform, this would be the correct color for that initial outlay. So if you're painting troops who have got fresh gear, honestly, a nice dark green like this is going to go fine. But the material would fade very quickly. And on top of that, you're in one of the sunniest, the sun bleaching effects in North Africa, you know, Libya, Egypt, Tunisia is insane. So other good colors would be Death World Forest. You'll see this is a little lighter, a little more yellow and less saturated. So this one would be good if you're looking to really quickly paint these guys and you want a sort of middling tone for their uniforms. But what we're going to use is this gump here, Middlestone. Now, the uniforms would sun bleach to a light beige, almost white. Uh, the caps in particular, I've seen a photo, he, obviously black and white photos, we can't be sure what the colors are based on that, but this dude's hat was white. So you can go pretty light with your uniform colors. Middlestone is a wonderful, just off beige kind of green. It's a very sickly color, but it is perfect for what we've got in mind. Now, because quite a lot of them is going to be this color, I've got a fairly large brush. This is the small dry brush from the Army Painter, and you'll see this covers over fairly well. I'm just going to go over most of his uniform, and I am not concerned if I hit anything else first. Let's just jam it around and lay this down. In some areas, you may find later on, once this is dried, that it looks a little bit patchy. You can come back and give it a second coat if you need to. Now there's that middle stone after a second coat in some areas. And you'll see next to yellow, it looks green. But I guarantee you, you put some green down, it's going to look yellow. It's a funny old color, but perfect for what we're doing. I have now a little bit of tanned flesh from the Army Painter, and I'm going to paint, no great surprise, here's tanned flesh. There isn't really a right way of painting the skin, uh, but tanned flesh is quite a nice base coat for a very sunny, tanned <laughs> complexion. You're probably going to find that this will need two coats, though. 
Once you've done that, I have here a little bit of Iraqi sand, and I'm going to use this for the Y belt on his webbing and his shoulder straps. You would sometimes see this in leather as well, but more commonly for these guys in the desert, it would have been a tan fabric or canvas. So a little bit of this Iraqi sand, two coats if you need it. And then speaking of those leather details, I've got here flat brown. And this is a wonderful warm reddish sort of leather. It's perfect for what we've got in mind. Now very briefly, these little ammo pouches here at the front, these smaller ones, they would quite commonly also have been the black leather that you see on other German troops. But those wearing the black leather ones would commonly then paint them with a sandy color. So you could just use Iraqi sand for the ammo pouches as well. In typical German uniform fashion, the rules are fairly strict, but the reality was a lot more lax. So after doing his shoes, any leather straps and what have you, that's the leather done. But I did remember, a little too late, that the MP40 magazine pouches, these would not have been leather. Instead, these would have been a canvas color. So I have here Khaki from Vallejo, and I'm just going to go over these. And at the same time, I'm going to paint in his bread bag with this color. Again, this would be a slightly greenish, uh, sort of almost felt color. But we're looking at sun bleached and worn. So khaki will do fine here. And then once you've got your khaki sorted, we're going to paint the little felt cover on the water bottle. Now this is quite a pale color ordinarily, so I have here tan earth. Now, ordinarily, that would be the last of the soft details that I would do. But there is one last here on this miniature because I have done the base already. So I'm going to apply a layer of brown sand over this brown sand. Uh, somebody laughed at me once saying, you know, why are you painting dirt to look like dirt? And the short answer is, well, at these sorts of scales, we need to exaggerate some details so that they look a little more accurate. So... Yeah, I'm going to paint the sand with sand. Give this a quick coat. Wait just a second, there is one last detail that I forgot about, and that is his gaiters. Now, these ones I'm using German camo beige, and it's interesting to me because these warlord sculpts for the Africa Corps, uh, these low gaiters, these were not the early mark of sort of knee-high looking boot gaiters. Uh, you could paint these guys in sort of temperate Feldgrau and use them as mid-war troops very easily. You know, as long as you don't have all of your guys running around Stalingrad in big goggles, uh, these would work for a lot of different things. So don't feel as though you're restricted to painting them in the Africa Corps look, and that's why I look at them as being a more veteran-style kit. With the last of those details done, I have a little bit of dark sand and one of my big soft makeup brushes. We're going to very lightly dry brush the whole miniature with some dark sand. And this is for two reasons. First off, we want to get a little bit more depth on our miniature. And catching the high points with a dry brush is a good way to do that. And secondly, because we're using the same sort of sandy beige color over everything, uh, he's going to look a little dusty. And here's our dude out in the desert, that's going to be fine. So dry brushing, you'll see, it's quite quick, very effective, but it does take a bit of practice. You definitely want to have too little paint on your brush rather than too much when you first start doing this. So have a bit of a play around and make sure you've got a little area like on his MP40 here to pass over a few times just to check that you're not leaving too much behind. When it comes to his skin, you can go over this as well. It's not going to matter because we're going to highlight that later with another color anyhow. So this dark sand is going to disappear. But let's go over all of these soft details and see what we have when we're done with that. That's nice and quick to do. It gives us a pretty good effect. I have gone down to a smaller brush to sneak in between his legs and get like behind his knees and what have you. But I would suggest in most cases... If you're struggling to reach an area with a brush, don't worry too much about painting it, because you're probably not going to see it on the table. We're now going to move on to hard details, so stuff like metal and wood. And I'm going to start with the wood. I have here beige brown. 
So obviously if he's got a rifle, you would start painting that now. I'm just going to do his stick grenades and this little bit on his entrenching tool here. Now the desert yellow that you get from the primer can and the Vallejo model color desert color that we're going to use now are not the same desert yellow color, which is why we're using desert yellow. But my goodness, anyway, desert yellow, we're going to apply this over any metallic areas. So on his helmet here and on his gas mask canister down on his belt. We'll turn here to German gray for a couple of small details. First of all, we'll do the tops of his grenades in this. One thing else that you can do with this is to apply it over any weapons that you want to have a blue gray finish. Uh, it's up to you if you like a metallic finish, uh, if you prefer that slightly shinier look, but if you like a, a blackened steel finish, uh, then German gray is a pretty good one for that. But there is something else we're going to use this for rather than just a handful of tiny details. Then our other use for German grey. Grab yourself an old brush, ideally one that doesn't keep much of a point anymore. I'm going to dip the tip into some of that German grey and then just dab most of it off onto a little bit of kitchen towel. And then just pick a couple of spots on some of this desert yellow to dab some little random scratches. Because as I was doing my research, it turns out that steel helmets were not standard issue for the troops in North Africa until 1943, which meant that in order to get a helmet, you had to have an enterprising unit commander who would source them, uh, and then they would go ahead and paint them because they were still that coal scuttle black underneath. Absolutely brilliant <laughs> to go with your uniform from the Tropical Institute. <laughs> Anyhow, as much of this as you want to do, uh, try not to go crazy with it because it will very quickly overpower the yellow. But a little bit of this just to introduce some scuffing and some texture to your metal stuff. Now this is definitely one worth having a bit of a practice with and playing around because it looks really cool and it is easy to overdo. So have a little test model to one side, you know, paint a spare head if you want to be macabre, but <laughs> Something to practice that on will look really good. I've got now some black and we're just going to paint in, well, the black details. On this fella, there's not going to be a lot of these, just a cover to his uh, water bottle. And over here, his bayonet sheath. And with a little splash of oily steel, I'm going to paint in his belt buckle. This could also have been lacquered either in a dark green or a sandy color, but I like the, you know, the tin underneath. We are going to use oily steel later on the gun again, but for now, that's fine. Now there is one final base coat to apply, and that is to his neckerchief. Now these were commonly civilian gear, which had been repurposed to, as sun shields and dust filters. I have here a little pastel blue, and all I'm going to do is just pop a quick coat of this around. This could be theoretically any color you liked. Um, I've seen some folks paint them, you know, red and spotted and what have you, but just look up neckerchiefs and handkerchiefs and similar of the period. You know, it is up to you what color this is going to be. Now, once at last all of those base coats are done, you can go around and do any tidy up that you need to. I've just touched in a couple of spots of the leather, but otherwise that's looking fine. What I've got now, this is Ali's Brown Liquid, and I have done a whole video on this. But to keep it short here, this is two parts Agrax Earthshade, two parts Seraphim Sepia, one part Lamian Medium, and then just a few drops of Drakenhof Nightshade for shading effect. And I'm using this because it is going to give us a warm shade, which still has the depth that Agrax Earthshade will give us, but without being as overpowering. So I'm going to be fairly generous with this and apply it over the entire miniature. Once we've got this worked into all of our recesses, we're going to let them dry for about half an hour, and we will see then what we get. And when I say the whole miniature, I do mean the whole thing, which includes the base. And once that's dry, you'll end up with something that looks like this, which is not too bad. But we can take it a little bit further, just to get a wee bit more definition between some of these areas. 
So I mentioned oily steel being used again earlier. So we'll get some of that. And what I'm going to do is use the edge of my brush just to pick out some of the edges of detail on the MP40. So don't go crazy with this. You don't want it to shine, but just a few small corners in particular, any edges of like the magazine, for example, just to brighten this up. Now while we've got it, we're going to use just a little bit of dark sand on our cloth stuff, just to brighten this up a tiny bit. Now if you want to spend a little time on making the metallic stuff look pretty cool, I've gone back to some Iraqi sand here, and I'm just using a tiny wee bit of this, just dotting fairly randomly underneath those steel chips around their edges, so that we get a slight three-dimensional effect. Now, if you'd like to, what you can do is grab some beige red, and I'm going to use this to highlight his skin. This is also very good as just a skin base color by itself, but what I'm going to do is apply this over most of his face and his hands, leaving just some of the recesses shaded with our tanned flesh. By comparison, that's going to look quite pale. What we're going to move on to is basic skin tone. Again, another Vallejo color. And this one, my goodness me, this is bright. I've watered this down just a little, as with all the others so far. And what I'm going to use this for is to just highlight a few strips along the back of his knuckles, his cheekbones, and similar. So don't go crazy with this, because my goodness, it's bright. But now he's too pale. So what I have is some mid-brown from the Army Painter. This is one of the inks, and really it is a... It's a funny old one, because it's more red than their flesh tone. But it is brilliant for adding a little bit more warmth to a skin tone, where you've maybe taken some of that warmth away, like we have with our highlights. And this is going to settle and give us a nice, warm, slightly sun-touched skin tone. You could use, uh, what is it, Reichland Flesh Shade here if you fancied, but I would still suggest thin it down a little with some medium if you do decide to use that shade. Now in the realm of not strictly necessary, but we're going to do it because it would look cool, I have here Pastel Green. And what I'm going to do is get some of the extreme edges, like along his uh, collar and his sleeves and what have you, just a little bit of this, to accentuate those edges. Once I've done that, I've very quickly added a touch of ivory to our blue from earlier, just to highlight his scarf. And that's it, really. What I'm going to do now is dry brush his base with a wee bit of pale sand, and we'll get a look at what he looks like when he's all finished. I do need to apply a varnish, too. So there at last, our German soldier of the Deutsches Afrika Corps is complete. And there's a lot more happening on these guys than you tend to see on some of the other miniatures from other armies involved in the Second World War. German equipment, man, it could just not be simple. You know, there's always something extra to paint. But hopefully here there's something that makes that a little bit easier, or breaks it down into something which is a little more approachable. In particular, I think the dented up helmet looks pretty cool. As always, thank you very much to Exit 23 Games for the light sound equipment, as well as all of the lovely patrons who keep me ticking in paints and glue, including my producers, Ella Nuttall, Kari Crawford, Trainboy, and Jimmy. Your support lets me keep doing this. Any questions or anything, feel free to drop them in the old comments box below. My Twitter and Instagram are both linked there too. So thank you very much for your time, one and all, and you all enjoy the rest of your day.